First, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, especially because I'm an immigrant. I'm a Western Australian now. Uh, we became citizens five years ago, as many of you probably know, and we're eternally grateful to Australia and Australians for letting us in. Thanks very much. Uh, we've uh, we've uh, just found the country amazing, warm, and full of opportunity for people who want to come and and, and work hard, and, and I think that says a lot about the country. And I'd also like to thank, uh, obviously, the National Trust for, and Water Corporation for uh, putting me up for this, and it's a real honor. And also to the, uh, the um, uh, people that you said were in the audience, the relatives of C.Y. O'Connor, thank you very much as well for allowing <coughs> me to come and talk to you today, um, I guess, a little bit about his legacy but uh, fast forwarding 115 years, I guess, to where we sit today. So look, there's the title of what I'm gonna talk about. It's a bit long, uh, you, can, you can read it. It was in the prospectus. Uh, what, I, what I really like to do though, <clears throat> if I may, is I'll give you a quick outline, it is number one, I'd like to spend a little bit of time reflecting on what I'm gonna call the calling of an engineer. C.Y. O'Connor, as we've heard, was a, an engineer, the first chief engineer of Western Australia, and has left us a fantastic legacy. Being an engineer myself, uh, and, and having done my engineering training in Canada, I really feel that it's a wonderful um, occasion to think about what it means to be an engineer back then and now, 100 years later. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, from a very personal perspective, if I may, before I use that to sort of segue into the main aspects of the talk, which are really around water. Now, I'm going to look at the big picture today. Uh, I'll drill down a little bit to some of the Australian, and, uh, the Australian picture, but what I want to do is really talk about the big issues, the big trends that are shaping the planet today, and how water really sits at the core of many of these big 21st century challenges. Often we talk about this as the energy, food, water nexus. Just think about that relationship between energy, food, water, and life, and biodiversity on the planet. That's really where, I, where the core of the talk will focus. And look, there are a lot of challenges, and there'll be a top time in the talk where I'm gonna go through all the challenges one by one. And we all know challenges are kind of a euphemism for problems or you know, things that are worrying us. Well, yeah, but don't get depressed because by the end, hopefully what I'll do is I'll start to focus on solutions because this hopefully is a good news talk. I'm an eternal optimist, as anyone knows me can attest. And what I'd like to do is to hopefully leave you with a feeling that it is all eminently and completely within our grasp to solve. And I'll just finish off with a little expose of something called the Australian National Outlook, which is a project that CSRO completed last year, which is really the first of its kind ever done in the world and is, just provides us with huge reasons for optimism, especially here in Australia. So, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to take you back to 1904, two years after C.Y. O'Connor died. <clears throat> These series of images are of the Quebec Bridge in Canada. This bridge was started in 1904 as one of the last links in Canada's great transcontinental national railway project that really united the, the continent the country from sea to sea. And at the time, it was conceived as the largest cantilever, free cantilever span bridge in the world at 490 meters. Later in the design phase, that 490 meters was, was increased to 550 meters free span, partly due to cost. The buttresses of the bridge, the further apart they are, the closer to the banks they are, in the shallower water, the cheaper they are to build. So the longer the span, the cheaper the bridge. Hence the, dr the drive for this, for this world record, if you will. By 1907, the bridge was nearing completion. On August 6th, Norman McClure, the Canadian engineer who was responsible for the on-site uh, on activities of the project, started to notice some deflections unusual deflections in some of the steel girders. 
he immediately wrote to the head engineer, uh, a chap called Theodore Cooper, based in New York with the Phoenix Bridge Company, and received uh, a reply two days later. The mail was very fast back then, by the way, <laughs> from New York to, uh, to Quebec, uh, that, look, no problem, a lot of the a lot of the sections we ordered have been pre-bent, pre-curved, for loading reasons. So, so don't worry about it. Keep going. But, but McClure wasn't satisfied. He, was, he thought something was up. So he took it on himself to start taking his own measurements. On August the 22nd, 27th, pardon me, he came to the point where he had noticed some pretty significant deviations and deflections. He again wrote to and telegrammed Cooper in New York, didn't get a response. <coughs> Two days later on August 29th, he decided to jump on the train and he traveled to New York to see Cooper with his data and his measurements in hand. Until that time, Cooper had steadfastly refused to come all the way up to the project site. He had never visited the project site. When McClure came into his office and showed him his data, data. Cooper relented and agreed that they should stop work on the bridge until further tests could be done. Tragically, a few hours after that meeting, before any notice could come back, the bridge collapsed in what could only be, was, was described as spectacular uh, conditions. 75 of the 86 men working on the bridge that day died, including 33 Mohawk Indians from the nearby village. Later that year, 1907, a royal commission was established to look into the, the, the disaster. And one of the things they concluded was in the haste to lengthen the bridge from 490 to 550 meters free span because of cost, the bridge was designed such that it was not able to even bear its own weight. So it's pretty inevitable, right? Numbers don't lie. Facts and figures don't lie. Engineering and science will, will always prevail in such a sense. So it was pretty bad. But look, it was an important bridge. The First World War came along. It became even more strategically important. Work pressed ahead. By 1960, the bridge was again nearing completion, this time with a completely new, uh, a new, a new design team. But on September the 11th, when the final span was being lifted into place in the middle, that span collapsed. 13 men were killed that day. It was later determined that the hoisting mechanisms used to, to lift the center span of the bridge up to complete uh, the, the span was improperly designed. That center span there that you can see, actually that's a photograph of it crashing into the water. You can see the white. That center span is still lying on the bottom of the river to this day. Somehow I've turned on the lights. I don't know quite how, but um, it's too much hand waving. By 1917, however, the bridge was finally com completed at a cost of $25 million, a uh, fortune back then, and 89 lives. In 1925, a group of engineers at the University of Toronto, largely in response to this, the largest engineering disaster in Canada up until the time, got together and decided, hey, you know what? We need a professional body that represents engineers that helps engineers across the nation come up with a common set of standards, of ethics, of behaviors, of principles, and of conduct. And that was the beginning of what, to this day, is um, a significant institution in Canada, the Canadian, with uh, chapters in each of the provinces across the country. And one of the things, uh, and by the way, there's the bridge uh, finished and, and operating. One of the things that this group of engineers did is that at the time, they invited the poet laureate of empire, who I'm sure you all recognize from his portrait here as Rudyard Kipling, 
the well-loved author of Kim and Jungle Book, etc., to write something. They felt they needed something to remind engineers, especially young engineers when they're graduating, of their importance of their role and the duty that they have, the duty of care that they have. And he wrote something called The Ode to the Calling of an Engineer. If it's okay for you and if it's okay for C.Y. O'Connor, Rest, may he rest in peace, wherever he is. I'd like to read it to you because I think he would have appreciated it. I'm going to have to take off my glasses because I can't get that close. It is their care in all the ages to take the buffet and cushion the shock. It is their care that the gear engages. It is their care that the switches lock. It is their care that the wheels run truly. It is their care to embark and entrain, tally, transport, and deliver duly the sons of Mary by land and by main. They do not preach that their God will rouse them a little before the nuts work loose. They do not pre preach that his pity allow them to drop their job when they damn well choose. As in the thronged and lighted ways, so in the dark and the desert they stand, wary and watchful all their days, that their brethren's ways may be long in the land. And the other thing they did was that they created this thing called the Iron Ring. I'm wearing one right here on my pinky, my little pinky of my right hand. And if you, this is the way you can tell a Canadian engineer. So any engineer in Canada, when they graduate, they get this little iron ring. It's worn on the working hand, working baby finger of your working hand. If you're right hand, that's on your right hand. If it's left hand, left hand. And so it's kind of a little secret society. You can always go, hey, man, hey, an engineer. <laughs> Not so secret. There is a bit of a secret ceremony. That poem that Roger Kipling wrote is read out at the ceremony. There's some other stuff that I'm not allowed to tell you that happens. But, but basically, the idea is to remind us, to remind engineers of all ages, and I still wear mine, I still, still practice, that we have a duty to society that goes beyond the duty to our employer beyond the duty to our CEO, to the person that pay, cuts our paycheck every, every week or every fortnight or however often we get a paycheck. I'm not getting anyone anymore. <laughs> but it's that duty to society that is beyond those day-to-day -day concerns. And I think that C.Y. O'Connor would have understood this, the tremendous responsibility that engineers carry. A doctor can get it wrong and maybe the patient is gonna die. But if an engineer gets it wrong, dozens of people can die, hundreds of people can die. And if you think about it, in the 21st century, with the power that we now wield with our technology, engineers could make mistakes if poorly guided by policy and by their own volition that could cost, well, the damage is potentially uh, beyond what I can imagine. And I think McClure, he understood this, as did C.Y. O'Connor, the need to speak up when you see something wrong, when you see that beam deflecting, when you see some hint of a problem coming, you have to speak up. It is your duty as an engineer. We are taught that, and that's why we wear this ring. And I'm making a not too subtle allegory to, I think, the duty that all citizens have when they see something that they know isn't right, that they need to stand up. And sometimes, and I think a C.Y. O'Connor, more than many, felt that you often do it at a personal cost. The people who stand up and who yell the alarm and call out things that that may not be very popular, can often pay a high price for it, but they need to do it because that's the only way we move forward. So 100 years on, <coughs> let's talk about something that's central to life on Earth, that's central to our well-being, to our prosperity, to our economic success, and, and that's water. And water sitting at the middle of everything that we do on this planet. And sitting here 100 years on from the issues that I just described, we're in a situation where we need desperately to be able to look into the future. 
Such are the forces on our planet now, the numbers of people, the size of the economy, the interconnectedness, that we need to understand what options we have and what the scenarios are. But the problem with prediction is that it's very difficult. Um, this is an old Danish proverb. It's very, very difficult to, con to uh, predict the future. And so engineers work with scenarios. We ask what if types of questions. What if this? What if that? What if we go in this direction? What are the likely consequences? And which of these routes is on balance one that we think is going to be the most valuable for society. So let me talk then about the big challenges that face us, that we look forward and scenario plan around. The first one that really drives everything else is population. Last year, we hit 7 billion people on the planet. In the next 35 years, we're going to add probably another 3.5 billion or so. The world's population is predicted to plateau out sometime around 2100 at anywhere between 10 and 12 billion, although recent studies now suggest that um, population stabilization is nowhere in sight. A few years ago we thought it might be, but now with changes to demographics and one-child policy removal in China and so on, that may no longer be the case. But the sheer fact of the matter is that there are more people now on the planet than ever before, we are growing, we are adding people at the, at the rate. I'll give you a sense of it. Next week, next Thursday night, where whatever you're doing, think back to this lecture and realize that there has now arrived another city the size of Perth on the planet. And then that will happen again by the following Thursday and so on and so forth for the rest of your life, most of us. There's some young people on the planet, in the room. Maybe it'll slow down by then. But that's, that's the rate at which people are being added. And each one of those people that is arriving on this planet now expects more than ever before from their lives. And so should they. But what this is doing is putting incredible stress on the system. At the same time, incomes are rising. This is from a futures work that CSRO Futures Division does, looking out at the current uh, income thresholds and projecting out here on the right to 2050. And the one thing that I want to just notice is, in the 2050, look at the big red bar here and the big orange, the thick orange bar. That's China and India. And look at where they are there. You're seeing this huge rise in the wealth and the buying power of some of the poorest people currently in the, in the world. And these millions and hundreds of millions of people who are coming up and becoming more wealthy are now wanting televisions and steak every couple of weeks, and, and everything that we enjoy. And so again, while that is a good thing, the stresses in terms of the, our ability as a planet to provide the resources to make those things happen is starting to come into question. And there's another cost to this. I don't know if anybody's very familiar with this, but there's a study that's been done on a repeating basis now for some decades. It's called the Living Planet Index, and it basically tracks, uh, there's others in the audience here who will be much more well-versed, I'm looking at Bruce, in terms of describing this than I am, because I'm just an engineer, not an ecologist, but it describes basically species abundance on the planet. And what we found is in the last 50 years, since 1970, basically, we've lost essentially half of the biodiversity on the planet. Now, if you fast forward another 40 years, which takes us out to the 2050, which I'm talking about when everyone's incomes are supposed to rise and everything else, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that if we don't change something fundamental about what we have been doing, about how we've been running the planet for the last 40 years, and just keep doing the same thing, same plan, next 40 years, you, you know where that line's going to go. And while expectations are growing, for many, basic needs are still not being met. One quarter of the people on the planet live on less than $1.25 a day. Because I'm no longer working and don't have a regular income, my wife and I have just did a budget and we're saying to ourselves, oh my God, how can people live here? We're trying to live on quite a bit more than $1.25 a day, but people do. Many, hundreds of millions of people have to um, on this planet right now. Now, the good news is that it was about half in 1990, so the 
num the percentage of people living on that has come down, but because there's so many more people than there are in 1990, there's still about the same number of people living like that that there, are, that there were then. A third of people live in, in urban slums. 15% of the world's population goes hungry. When we come to water, the statistics are pretty strong. One billion people on this planet do not have access to a, self, to a safe, clean uh, supply of drinking water, like we're blessed with here in WA, and I'm going to have some. That's my cue. <clears throat> Lectern is sloped. <clears throat> Angle of failure there won't work. And 2.5 billion people on the planet don't have access to basic sanitation. And of course, those things two together go, go together. If you supply water, you have to deal with the wastes that are created. So there's real challenges there. This is a picture I took when I was working in Africa many, many years ago. And of course, with all these people on the planet, we got to eat. And global food demand is rising fast. In fact, according to um, Norman Borlaug in 2009, more food will need to be produced worldwide over the next 50 years than has pr been produced in the last 10,000 years. The f demand for food will literally double by 2050. So we've got to start figuring out how to grow more food. And everyone knows that one of the key ingredients you need to grow food is water. But at the same time, we've got these stressors here on the left. So we're, we're pushing hard to provide all these things, but we've got some real challenges that are pushing back. Planetary boundaries, water stress, climate change, which I'll talk about a little bit, but I don't want to get too deflected. Invasive pests, soil degradation, and so on. We've got some of these problems here in WA with soil salinization. Right? So in, in, the way, in a way, WA is a little microcosm of a lot of these problems. In fact, some workers have called this the perfect storm, the food, energy, water, trilemma. And the key, just remember, the, the key thing to remember about this slide is that these things are all connected. Water requires huge amounts of energy to pump, to clean, to treat, to dispose of. In fact, it's one of the largest energy users uh, in the world, the managing of water one way or another, pumping, cleaning, disposing, treating, and so on. And I'm sure the Water Corp can attest to that when they look at their power bills. But we all know that we, we have a, a, a real energy issue on the planet now, and it's in the papers every day. But at the same time, you need a lot of energy and a lot of water to grow food. So these things are all absolutely interconnected. You push on one and you move the others. And in the middle is a changing climate which affects all of those or is affected by some of those. So it's a really interesting position. Now let's come a little bit closer to home in Australia. We live on the driest inhabited continent in the world. You're Australians, you all know that, but still as, as a dual citizen, a Canadian part of me, I always find that a, a, Quite a, quite a statistic, especially when you look at the annual stream flow data here. I mean, we are right down there at the near zero compared to most parts of the, of the world. And yet, the irony is we have the highest per capita water use. So we just flip that right around. And while that seems a challenge, as I'll come to in a little while, challenge means opportunity. And Australia, this and other things have actually driven Australia to a, to a, a world-leading position in water management. Another challenge we have is that of all the parts of the world that are really seeing the current near-term signature of climate change, we are definitely one of the canaries in the coal mine. The Canadian Arctic, where, uh, in, where I'm from, is, is another. But one of the things that is really marked is the change in, in freshwater, in rainfall distribution over the last 50 years. This is a, a Bureau of Meteorology and CSRO combined slide. And what it basically shows, the dark areas show increased rainfall, and the white areas, so along the eastern coast, and then of course in our little corner of the world, white means significant declines. Another way of looking at it is this. This is from the 2014 State of the Climate Report from CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology. We issue one every two years. They issue one every two years. And what you basically see is the areas of dark red are lowest 
rainfall on record. And the areas of dark gray are the highest on record ever. So you see a very, very definitive pattern of rainfall moving towards the equator and drying poleward. By the way, this general trend is one that the most rudimentary global climate models were predicting back in the 70s and 80s. This is not a surprise, ladies and gentlemen, to anybody in the scientific community, and yet we still seem to be debating the science for some reason. I'll come to that in a minute. It's a little bit of a taster. But the point is that this is real, this is real data. There's a deflection in the beam here. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? Are we going to cable New York, or are we going to go and stamp our feet and, walk and take the train down there? So we've got a lot of challenges. They're all interconnected. And I know that some people, especially young people, come to me sometimes when I'm lecturing at university and so on. And some of them are pretty despondent. Like, oh, you know, I don't want to use bad language, but what the, you know, have you guys done? And, and you're just leaving it all for us to deal with. Um, but I like to be very optimistic. And the reason is, is that the solutions to all of these big interconnected challenges of water, energy, food, biodiversity, they all exist now. The engineering solutions exist now. The science always needs to be upgraded. We always need to know more, but we know enough now to make a start on all of these challenges. We have management systems. We have tools. We have processes. We have policy settings that are available. We have economic instruments that we can deploy, and together, if we decide to use them, we can change the world, and we can do it really quickly. What a great, fantastic. But you know what? It's not about any of that. It's actually about people. This is what it's about. It's about making better decisions individually and collectively at every scale. And if we can unlock that challenge, the rest of it is easy. Let me give you some examples from Australia of, of, of just how, how well we've done. In terms of delivering water reform and water policy, this nation stands alone, almost, at the top, the best in the world. Why? Because years ago, we recognized the importance of water to Australia. That thing I showed you about no water and high demand, so we have to use it well. And we did. We invested, as a nation, over the last decades in good water science, good water information. That led our ability to accurately predict rainfall and weather patterns while well, we're getting better, but certainly flows and floods and forecast that. That allowed us to, ele to prudently allocate water to different uses, particularly I'm talking now back east. It allowed us to start down the journey of fair and equitable sharing and pricing of scarce resource and pricing of water at its true value is a critical element of this because what it allows is greater efficiency in water use and that then allows allowing setting up of functioning water markets. And again, we lead the world in that. And p countries from around the world come to Australia to see how we've done it. How, how have you done this? How have you set up water markets? And how does the information and the science flow in to help us make informed decisions which then allow us to make judicious infrastructure investments? So it can be done, and it is being done here in Australia, and, 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 and pretty well, by and large. I'll give you an example of just how well this works. We've all heard of the millennium drought back in the first uh, decade of this millennium. Now, you don't, these slides are, are small. I know you're all squinting. I'll just explain to you really simply. The light blue bars are the decline in water availability during those years. And it goes from 2006 to 2011. 2006 to 2011. The dark blue bars are, represent the increase or decrease in productivity. So um, in the actual farm receipts. So how much money did we earn uh, from those products, from those farm products? And what you see there is in 2009, for instance, at the height of the millennium drought, there was there was less than a, a quarter of the original amount of water, the normal amount of flow available to farmers. 
And yet, by then, there was only a 20% decrease in the actual net economic farm receipts. And by the end, by 2011, look what happens to the little blue. It's gone positive. We've still got less than half of the available water, but markets and efficient allocation and good policy has meant that we're actually making more money from our agricultural produce than we did before the millennium drought started. And that's a great example of how the power of markets, the power of water pricing and good management can be brought to bear to benefit everybody. Now look, don't worry about this one. This basically just shows that it was about moving water allocation to higher value crops that use less water. Hey, it makes sense, right? But it's getting the gears and the mechanisms to shift and lock and work together, which is what markets are really good at if they're properly constrained and properly informed. The same thing is happening in energy around the developed world in particular, but also now increasingly in the developing world, which is really good news, is that we're getting more economic output per unit of energy that we put in. This is in Australia, it goes from 2008 to 2012, and you can see here a steadily decreasing amount of energy for each unit of output, which is fantastic. We're getting more <coughs> efficient, we're driving those efficiencies. As I said, Engineers can find all kinds of ways of doing it if the signals, the market signals and the price signals are there for them to act. And then in the broader area of agriculture, land use, crop management, irrigation techniques, food logistics, the preservation of food, the, the use of smart technologies to get the food from the, right, from the source to the right um, distributors and to the right customers quickly and efficiently, which minimizes waste, all means that we can feed more people with the same amount of water and the same amount of food. And the possibilities here are huge. There's huge latent potential to get even more efficient with what we do. So again, as I said, there's huge reasons to be optimistic. But it all comes down to how we make decisions in the end, because none of that technology is any good if we're not using it, or if we're not deploying it, or if as a society, or as a company, or as an individual, we choose just not to do it and to stick with the same old, same old. And I often pondered this for years, and it wasn't until I started working with some of the CSIRO scientists who work in the economic and the social sciences that I really started to get a better insight of this. And we call it VRK. And basically what it means is that people make decisions based on three things their values, call it your worldview, things you care about, things that you think are important, how you see the world. Two, rules, the rules that you have been brought up in, the rules of our society, of our communities, the unwritten rules, the laws, the regulations, and, then, and knowledge, facts, information. And as scientists and engineers, I think of many, many different issues, we've kind of spent our lives thinking, boy, you know, if we just do the work and get the science and provide it to the decision makers of all kinds, they'll look at it, they'll see the logic, and they'll make the right decision, right? And then over the years, when they've been given that information and they're still making the wrong decisions, they're still making bad decisions, we go, oh, they need more facts. They need more knowledge. Or actually, maybe they need it in a different format. Instead of reports, we need to have videos or interactive displays or an app. I mean, you know, we just aren't getting the, the knowledge to them in the right form. But you know what? Climate change shows this. There can be a mountain, an Everest of knowledge, but it will not carry the day. It will not affect the response because the two other areas are working as well. And if your worldview is, is of a certain disposition, those facts aren't enough on their own to sway you to come to a different decision than you might have otherwise. And so if we are to make progress, we need to understand this dynamic. And as a collective, we need to respect the other positions. We need to recognize that knowledge on its own isn't the be all and end all, that there are other things that matter. And we have to engage in the middle and stop throwing hand grenades at each other from the trenches and come out of the trenches and shake hands and start working together.
The other thing that's an impediment but could turn very quickly into a huge positive for us is redefining our notion of value and unleashing the power of markets. Right now, our world it runs on one idea, and that's the increase forever, every year, of GDP, of gross domestic product. That's when people say growth on the radio, that's what they mean. They mean that GDP has to keep growing. Now, I've reflected on this a lot, and one of the things about GDP is it's a completely flawed measure of success. There's four big reasons. I'll give them to you very, very quickly. There are a lot of others. Number one, GDP does not recognize any unpaid work. So if you stay at home and look after kids or old people, if you volunteer, if you teach baseball or cricket or anything that you do, or you volunteer planting trees for your community, none of that time or effort counts as work, counts as value in this all-important statistic, which is essentially the economy. Second, GDP does not take into account the damage that we do in the creation of this wealth, all these goods and services we're producing. So the trees that we cut down, the land that we strip, the soil that we use, the, the seas that we clean out, and the pollution that we pour into our atmosphere and our water and our lungs, these things are not included, these damages. But thirdly, any defensive measures that we take to protect ourselves from the damage that we do to the environment and to each other is counted in GDP. So I was just spent three weeks with my family in, in northern India. We were in New Delhi and in the north, some of the industrial cities north of New Delhi for about a week and a half. And I have never in my life, and I've been to a lot of places, seen air pollution that bad. Literally in a car at night, the headlights are on, it's like being in fog. Except it's not fog. You can't see 50 meters, traffic slowed down. It's PM 2.5, it's NOx, it's SOx, it's everything you can think of. And I reflected that around this time for the last few months in New Delhi, merchants have sold something like 10 million high-tech personal breathing apparatus. Because kids and old people in particular are literally coming down with chronic respiratory illness. And so here's a wonderful situation where the GDP is increasing because all that stuff is being burned and filling up the atmosphere with all that stuff, all the coal and all the energy and all the open garbage. And there's a boost to the economy as well because you had to build and distribute and sell 10 million of these masks at 50 bucks a pop. So the GDP loves that. It's good. Air pollution is good for GDP. The Gulf of Mexico air oil spill was good for the GDP of Louisiana. There was a huge influx of workers and emergency equipment and lawyers and everything else spending huge amounts of money to clean up the damage. But of course, the marine environment that suffered wasn't included in that GDP calculation. And fourth, finally, not to belabor the point, but you're getting the message now, I think, is that any depreciation in natural capital that we experience isn't included as well. So all the non-renewable resources that we dig up and mine out and use, that's not included. We only measure the, <coughs> the value of the stuff that's produced. So when you put those four things together, what you come at is a, is a realization that there is something fundamentally wrong with an economic system that's trying to run such a complex planet with one instrument on our one dial on our instrument panel, one GDP, one, one arm on that thing. And, and if that thing starts to go down a little bit, and GDP, we have to push on the accelerator pedal to get it back up, to get growth, because it's the only thing that we're currently measuring. It's out of date. It doesn't work. And you can, it's driving perverse behaviors, because it doesn't value all these other things that we care about, even people. It only values people in terms of whether or not they can buy stuff. That's it. So 
we all know that on this complex world, there is a lot more that we care about than just the economy. And yet, decisions that are made every day always come down to, at the upper levels, always come down to money. It always comes down to keeping the economy going. You listen to the radio sometimes, and you actually think that, perversely, I'm here to serve the economy. Funny, I thought the economy here was here to serve me. Oh, OK. Turn that around. Simple changes to GDP. There are other measures out there, things like net national welfare, which takes GDP and just corrects those four things that I talked about. And all of a sudden, you come up with a very different picture and a very different signal. And all of a sudden, different decisions are being made. It can happen literally overnight. I'd like to very finish up with a few slides on this national outlook, the CSRO national outlook. It's a great piece of work. It's in the public domain. You can go on the website and you can download it. It's incredibly detailed, but it provides some really, really serious reasons for optimism. And I'm going to very quickly highlight four or five of the really, I think, fundamental findings. This particular study, which went for four years and was you know, a pretty big effort inside CSRO, tried to answer some big questions. And really, it was around, can Australia, in its unique position, break the links between economic growth and the environmental pressures that weigh on the other side so that overall environmental standards can rise while living standards increase, wealth increases? And if so, what measures will lead to those kinds of outcomes? And importantly, what is the contribution of individual versus collective choices? How important in reaching these types of more advantageous outcomes to the country, how much of it is driven by what we decide to do as individuals? How much is this driven by what we can do as collectives, as organizations, as companies, as governments? And what we sought to do was model this energy, food, water nexus, essentially. And in fact, for the first time ever, this was done using a series of interconnected models, which I'll come to. But basically, the three entry points for this are about water security, food security, and energy security for Australia, things that I think we can agree we all, we all want. And then examining in the middle a number of different scenarios around population and economic growth, uh, ecosystem services, natural assets, and environmental and climate change. So all of these things were brought together in a series of integrated models. This is revolutionary work. It's never been done before anywhere else in the world. And the, uh, the work actually was peer-reviewed internationally and was featured on the cover of Nature Journal. Now, if you don't know what that means, to a scientist, it's the equivalent of having your, your picture on the front cover of Time magazine. I mean, this is a big deal. So it was peer reviewed internationally and very, very well received. And basically what all this says is that in the middle, you had general equilibrium economic models similar to what Treasury uses to model our economy. But what we did, what CSRO did, the team at CSRO did is that they started to physically couple land use models, water models, food, Greenhouse gas emissions, materials flows in the economy, and ideas around consumption, leisure, buying patterns, and so on of individual Australians. And this is all coupled in very, very complex modeling, which I'm not going to even bother to try and um, describe, which because I, I can't. And there were some amazing findings that came out of this. Now, the first thing I'll say is that it really worked around four key scenarios. And those scenarios are, are these purple, green, blue, orange bars, basically. The purple scenario is basically what they call a stretch scenario. So that's policies that are very progressive, designed to really tackle the big challenges that I've been talking around, food, water, energy, climate. The green is more around existing trends, so some small improvements. Uh, a, gre a blue is sort of a mixed scenario. And the orange really is a business as usual, uh, very conventional, almost a 20th century approach to running the country and running um, our economy and our nation. And what you find is some amazing things. Number one is that rising water demand in Australia can be met, as it has been, while enhancing water security. 
through a combination of all the measures I've talked about, technology, management systems, smart, smart water metering, pricing, good water policy, and also the increased use of desalination coupled with powered by renewable energy. So that's, a, that's an amazing uh, finding and very, very, I think, positive for the future. The other one is that and it's perhaps a bit of a paradox, particularly for people who aren't well disposed towards this particular issue, but stronger global action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will provide, can for Australia, actually can provide win-win economic outcomes, win-win economic and environmental outcomes, pardon me, by 2050, if we so choose to take action. This will not happen by itself. We have to decide as a collective, to take certain steps and to go down a certain path, choose a certain scenario, and that will happen for us. It's very, very clear in the modeling. Another key finding is that the food energy water nexus can actually produce huge opportunities for rural communities. So in a time of steadily declining rural wealth and rural incomes, if you look over the previous decades, Getting our policy settings right, choosing the right trajectories and the right measures can actually mean huge increases in wealth for rural populations. Largely around significant changes in land use, moving away from agricultural use of marginal land, the huge amounts of marginal land in Australia, and moving towards significant biodiverse carbon sequestration plantings and selling those on international markets. Now, if you look, think about the next 35 years, those things are going to be needed and are going to come. And we can really take advantage of them. For me, perhaps the most exciting of these findings is that for the first time since Europeans landed in this great country, we can, if we so choose, decouple wealth creation from environmental degradation. Until now, they've gone in opposite directions. We got richer and the environment has suffered. We are now in a position, given what we know, given the technology, given the thinking and all the science that I've described and much more, we are now in a position where we can actually do the opposite. We can significantly increase the wealth of the Australians and at the same time, for the first time, stop species decline and actually turn the balance back the other way. We can start improving the environment in Australia. Not just holding the line, but improving it. It's within our grasp. And we can do it while we make ourselves richer. But it requires, it won't happen by accident. And then the final point I'll make is that, interestingly, what the findings show is that it is collective action which will account for the vast majority of those changes if they are to, to occur. That's what will drive it. Now, it's not uniform. There's net emissions, there's emissions. The second pair of bars is water use. The th third set of bars is energy use. The green bits are the impact of individual action. The blue is collective action. And you can see here that water, that actually, you know, individual action does make a difference. We know that. And it will continue to. But on big issues like greenhouse gas emissions, it is the collective choices that will decide where we go. I ride my bike every day, and I can do it for the rest of my life. And what that's telling me is it won't make any difference to the emissions profiles. But I'll keep doing it, because it's healthy. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to just finish with a summary that really, hopefully, brings forward some of the key things that I hope, um, I hope I've got across. This water, food, energy challenge that we're facing is significant. We're not going to sugarcoat it. It's huge. It's a big thing. It is the challenge of, 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 of our time, of our century. Engineering and science can provide the means to get more from less everywhere, to optimize the use of water, to increase living standards while halting and even reversing environmental degradation. The thing that's standing in our way right now is that we need people to provide the direction. We must make decisions together. We must work together to provide the policy settings that unleash these, the, the power that we have. 
Collective policy choices are critical, and Australia can be a leader. I fundamentally reject an argument I hear all the time that, oh, we're so small, and we represent such a small part of the world's economy, and we're only 20 million people. <coughs> no, no, we are actually incredibly influential, and we can be real leaders, and leadership is the key. And as C.Y. O'Connor did back 115 years ago and more and during his career, we have to challenge the perceptions about what's possible. We can no longer just be led to believe that there's only one way to live our lives, that there's only one way to run an economy, there's only one way to measure success in our lives. It's just not true. And the sooner that we can find that, find those truths and start working together, the sooner we're going to create the incredible 21st century that we and our children and our grandchildren deserve and want. Thank you very much.